Good afternoon, everyone. My name is David Wood. I am the Special Projects Coordinator for Early Music of America. We want to welcome you uh, for another one of our Early Music Interest Sessions here uh, today with Michael Delphine. And uh, in just a few moments, we'll begin that part of the presentation. But for now, just a couple of housekeeping items as we begin. Uh, if you're new to Zoom or you haven't done a webinar, or you just need a refresher, um, there are a couple of ways that you can interact with this particular webinar. And you can see those options here uh, on the screen. Uh, if you're joining us via Facebook Live, you're always welcome to share your questions in the comments and we'll keep an eye out for that. Throughout this session, if you have questions, please use the Q&A function. You'll click Q&A and then type in your questions and uh, we will hold those until later in the presentation and then uh, address as many of those as possible. If you need to ask for any uh, any help technically throughout the uh, throughout the presentation or want to interact with others who are in the Zoom call, you can use the chat feature. We won't be taking questions through that, uh, but that's how you interact. And then uh, if there is a uh, portion of the presentation where we will be asking questions uh, and we want to uh, hear from you as uh, you un uh, are unmuted, then we'll ask you to use the raise hand function to let us know uh, that you would like to contribute that way uh, if we open uh, that part up to the public. We'd also like to uh, draw your attention to the Early Music Relief Fund. Oh, I uh, well, scooted too fast here. The Early Music America Relief Fund at earlymusicamerica.org, which at this point has raised over $90,000 toward uh, early musicians in need during the COVID-19 global pandemic. Uh, if you are able to give, every single dollar goes toward early musicians in need during this time. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube at the links listed here. Uh, we'll, we are also on Facebook Live right now with this presentation and we welcome everybody who's joining us that way. This presentation along with our previous interest sessions will be archived at our YouTube channel and you can find out about a lot more as well as some of our past uh, Young Performers Festivals, Emerging Artist Showcase and more on our YouTube channel as well. And if you'd like to find out about these interest sessions and more news from the Early Music, uh, Early Music America community and the Early Music community throughout North America, you can sign up for our news list. You can do that through a text to uh, 42828, just text Early Music or use the button at the bottom of earlymusicamerica.org. Uh, we'd like to thank you all for being here and like to welcome now uh, Michael Delphine, who is our panelist for today. And uh, I'm going to ask Michael as soon as uh, as soon as we see him, if to uh, briefly introduce himself, um, and then Michael will will uh, take on this presentation, and I will disappear, but I will still be here. If anyone needs questions uh, or has questions throughout or has any technical difficulties, please let me know. So, Michael, welcome, and uh, we'd love to hear a little bit about you before you start your presentation. Well, hello everyone. I am Michael, and I would say it's nice to meet you all, but we may have to save that for another time, at least in person. I live in Cincinnati, and I'm pursuing a doctorate in piano at CCM here, also pursuing one in harpsichord. Historical performance is a huge interest of mine in many ways, both early music and in what we might call traditional piano playing. Um, I think we should get started. So let me make sure my technology is working and then we'll get rolling. Okay, David, we good so far? Everything's great. Okay, well, in beginning, I'd like to convey my heartiest thanks to Early Music America for hosting these online sessions and for inviting me to speak in today's session. I would also like to thank David Wood for hosting and for helping me with the tech aspects for today. Um, speaking of which, those of you tuning in live will receive several handouts through the Zoom chat in a few moments to help facilitate this presentation or help it make sense. 
Uh, you should have a published score of the piece, a template of markings, and a bibliography, which you can take a look at at the end. Now I will share my screen so you can see what this is all about. There. Among the many challenges that a performer faces in the music of Johannes Brahms, the choice Tempo and tempo flexibility are among the most elusive. His tempo and expression markings are highly specific, yet Brahms refused to provide metronome markings because of his complete distaste for using the instrument. Additionally, Brahms used highly specific expression markings, which may affect tempo with varying degrees of flexibility. Coincidentally, Brahms was known for his frequent and very sensitive use of rubato as is evidenced by written accounts of his performances from contemporaries. The placement and evolution of Brahms's tempo and expression markings in the variations in Fugue on a Theme of Handel, Opus 24, assist the performer in two crucial aspects of interpretation. They both reveal significant musical intent for the performer and also help the performer achieve a balance between consistent overall pulse across a large scale work and flexibility in tempo, two traits of his playing made evident in written accounts. I will interject to say that if you would like to actually see me talking besides um, slideshow material in front of you, see if you can toggle back and forth. It's a little bit difficult for me to do that from the distance of the computer, even with a portable mouse, but Go ahead and try if you can. Three underlying questions motivate this study of the Handel variations and are the three parts of this presentation. First, how do expressive markings influence underlying bass tempi and variations? Unlike others of Brahms's variation sets, which employ highly detailed tempo markings, the Handel variations uses only simple markings. Furthermore, Brahms did little to distinguish expressive markings from tempo markings in the initial autograph, but made a greater distinction for the engraver's copy, which most editions follow unanimously. An analysis of Brahms's manner of writing markings is therefore crucial to the study. Second, do Brahms's markings suggest that variations are linked by a proportion in tempo? Brahms's surviving metronome markings in other works both indicate rhythmic proportionality across variations and may also help the performer produce a linear tempo plan by unifying Opus 24's numerous and diverse sections. Brahms scholars Bernard Sherman and Jonathan Govias have investigated such techniques in other large-scale works, including the Haydn variations, Opus 56, and this presentation will utilize their findings. And third, do the markings in Opus 24 support claims of Brahms's own tempo flexibility in performance? Applying the observation of Brahms's contemporaries through the lens of modern scholarship will reinforce the interpretation of expressive markings in the final version of Opus 24 while nuancing the proportionality of tempi across the work. see. We begin first with the context of Brahms's tempo indications. Through, sorry, though metronome markings were by no means the default indication of tempo in the mid-19th century, the metronome's popularity was on the rise. Even so, Brahms left only 49 metronome markings in either print, instruction, or anecdote and most of these do not appear in published scores. The reason for this scarcity is communicated through a letter to the English baritone, George Henschel, who mediated correspondence with the conductor Otto Goldschmidt for performance of the German Requiem in February 1990. 
Now my computer is not letting me share things, so give me just a moment. There. We're just going to go through slides this way and make it easier. When asked whether or not the metronome markings should be strictly adhered to, Brahms replied, I think here as well as with other music, the metronome is of no value. As far at least as my experience goes, everybody has sooner or later withdrawn his metronome markings. I myself have, neither, have never believed that my blood and a mechanical instrument go well together. The so-called elastic tempo is moreover not a new invention. Con discrezione should be added to that as to many other findings, end quote. More pointedly, when suggesting to Clara Schumann not to revise her late husband's metronome markings, he wrote in 1861, the year of Opus 24's composition, by the way, I advise you to stay clear of it, for intelligent people will pay little attention to your painstaking labor and will not use it. Brahms' reasoning is made clear in the same letter to Henschel. I indicate without figures my tempo modestly to be sure, but with the greatest care and clear clearness. Opus 24 exemplifies this precision as we shall soon see. Any extant metronome markings from Brahms have been preserved through the labors of his circle. He himself withdrew every one of them before publication. Even without numerical values, Brahms wrote his tempo markings in painstaking deal, detail, no matter how simple or intricate. Fanny Davies, a British pianist who took lessons with Brahms, remarked that, quote, he was most particular that his marks of expression, always as few as possible, should be the means of conveying the inner musical meaning. In addition, Qualifiers attached to tempo markings often helped nuance their character or dictate it depending on the context, as Jonathan Govias argues. A few instances from Brahms' prior solo piano works provide ample evidence of precision. And for today's purposes, I am using the public domain Breitkopf and Hartel edition, but the markings agree with Henle, Wiener Urtext, and Berenreiter, which are far more scholarly. We have this example from the ballad in D major, opus 10, number two. If you see the opening andante marking is written in bold and the following allegro non troppo marking are also written in bold. Note also an espressivo e dolce. If you observe the ballad, opus 10, number four, we have more very detailed instructions, but also for character and execution, a tempo marking, più lento, and this marking called intissimo, intimissimo, sentimento ma senza troppo marcare la melodia. There is also significant variety in the markings and in the manner in which they are written in the scherzo in E flat minor, opus four. Rush und Führig for a tempo, molto espressivo in the second trio, but also sostenuto, moving towards dolce, a tempo marking moving towards a character marking. Now we turn to it, our attention to markings in Brahms's first published variations, the Schumann Variations Opus 9. This tempo marking here in German is Robert's own, and the level of detail possibly influenced the variations. Variation two is one of many examples. We have poco più moto as a tempo, espressivo as a character, poco rifadando for tempo, moving to an in tempo in bold. And there's much more throughout this work. Variations on an original theme, Opus 21, number one, indicate tempo markings such as poco larghetto, very detailed expressive markings and an articulation marking. Also dynamics. 
Variation one, we have molto piano e legato, so a marking for execution. Teneramente, marking for character. Then we look at variation five, which is much more detailed. We have character, tempo, and execution. Likewise, Opus 21 number one contains abundantly detailed markings. By now, one may note the differences in style, size, and specifics of each marking. Having noticed these specifics, we turn finally to Opus 24. Brahms composed the Handel Variations, Opus 24, in September 1861 for Clara Schumann and described it to the publisher, Breitkopf and Hartel, as his, quote, favorite work. Interestingly enough, he was my age when the piece was published, and now for a moment of silence while I let that sink in. Okay. The theme comes from an aria with variations in Handel's suite in B-flat major for harpsichord. HWV 434 if you want to go find it on IMSLP. Upon composing the work, Brahms incorporated revisions into the final engraver's copy, specifically notes, one example of variation order, and most importantly, tempo and expressive markings. The relevance of all of this contextual knowledge I have provided is threefold. First, unlike the markings in Brahms's other variations to date, Handel's theme in Opus 24 contains no markings whatsoever, and Brahms's markings in the Opus 24 variations remain consistently brief. Additionally, expression and tempo markings in the first published edition and in every edition since appear uniformly in lowercase italics. Second, the original autograph itself bears no distinctions in handwriting between markings for tempo and expression. Several markings are underlined and placed above the upper staff, while others are not underlined, but still above the staff, while still others are placed between staves resembling expressive markings in standard print, such as Dolce or the Giro. And I will show this on PowerPoint very soon. I'm going back and forth here. Third, the manner of Brahms's minimal revisions in the initial autograph suggests that markings for tempo and expression synonymously describe both character and execution in performance. Now I will pull up the PowerPoint again. A brief survey of these variations reveal categories of markings, and I've found three. First, certain markings directly affect tempo. We see con vivatita in variation seven and largamente ma non più in variation 13. Note also the espressivo marking. Second, and more prominently, certain markings affect tempo sorry, affect character and likely tempo. We see risoluto in variation four, espressivo in variations five and 21, which is on the bottom there. Suave in variation 12, meaning sweet. Sciolto, meaning nimble or lightly in variation 14, and many more. And the third category is that some variations have no markings at all, specifically 1, 6, 8, 15, 24, 25, and the fugue. But they all immediately follow variations with specific markings themselves. Now the evolution of these markings from autograph to engraver's copy provides insight into their meaning for Brahms and also may nuance the performer's inv invitation, yeah, interpretation. Many tempo and expression markings either remain the same or similar. Note not only the original markings and handwriting, but also where on the staff they occur. Variation 4's vivace was changed to risoluto. Molto vivace became con vivacità in variation 7. Piumoto and poco rubato in variation 12 were completely changed to suave. And variation 23's molto vivace became vivace e staccato. These changes indicate Brahms's direction of creative thought and ultimate intent. 
And this depth of study can enhance the performer's conception of tempo in making interpretational decisions. Variation four was designed to communicate liveliness and then resolve. Variation seven was changed from being merely, quote, very lively to, quote, with liveliness. A former increase in speed in variation 12 is now merely a sweet character. And variation 23 carries not just liveliness, but also clarity and touch. Additionally, the layout and handwriting of these markings influences interpretation. Brahms scholar Styra Avens refers to a correspondence between Brahms and Simrock editor Robert Keller, explaining a difference in handwriting. Keller asked if the difference between the capitalized word in bold, tranquilo, in this instance, and the lowercase and usually italicized tranquilo was a change of tempo versus a warning not to rush. Evans argues that Brahms intended a difference between capitalized markings, usually bold and above the staff, that indicated a change in tempo, and lowercase markings, usually italicized and within the staff, that indicated tempo flexibility within an overall pulse. Though not a blanket statement for all of Brahms's music, this principle readily find, finds application in the Handel variations. In addition, Brahms's lowercase Italian markings affect both flexibility and character, as Jonathan Govias asserts. This statement easily re resonates with mid 19th century writings such as Czerny's Pianoforte School in 1839, which highlights the use of a flexible tempo in espressivo of passages, which are easily found in Brahms's music. Certain variations in Opus 24 may at first invite a significant variance in tempo such as the dolce and suave in variations of 11 and 12, leading to largo mente ma non più and espressivo in variation 13 to sciolto in variation 14. However, Govias contends that a word for expression used as a tempo marking is not directed at pulse, but at character and style. Nonetheless, he offers a solution, which is the second main point of this presentation. In order to maintain the integrity of a work's large scale structure and performance, one may relate tempo proportionately in a linear tempo plan and thus stay within a large scale pulse while following the markings for character changes. Govias describes a linear tempo plan as a phenomenon which, quote, allows a remarkable amount of nuance and flexibility in tempos within and between variations, while still containing the work, sorry, the whole, within a tempo range limited only by practicality, end quote. Coupled with this theory is Bernard Sherman's theory that based on metronome markings and tempo indications, Brahms desired proportional temporal relationships between movements and sections of movements based on precise ratios of note values. This proportionality not only contributes to a unified and nuanced tempo plan, but it also agrees with the recollections of Brahms's only formal composition student, Gustav Jenner. Brahms's views on the variation process precluded capricious changes from one variation to the next. The work as a whole was still kept in perspective, Jenner wrote. Proportionality accomplishes this goal. It is not only inherent in good music making, as Sherman and Evans both argue, but it also stems from Brahms's understanding of the Renaissance tactus, owing to his interest in and knowledge of older forms and styles. Now, the Handel variations readily invites a linear plan. Some limitations exist in the first 10 variations, but even they convey this technique to some degree. You should have in the handouts. Oh my. Okay. Um, I did not see that coming. Sorry about that. <laughs> the table just broke. That's gotta be a first. <laughs> okay. In my handout, you should find, <laughs> you should find um, my own linear tempo plan for this piece. 
and it would be extremely helpful to have the score on hand as well. I would like to start my application with variation 11. Please pull up this handout if you have it handy. While I try to make this work without the use of my digital mouse, so sorry for the inconvenience. Okay. Now, if one begins variation 11 with a tempo marking of quarter note equals 84, um, David, please holler if something goes wrong and people can't see or hear. Let's see. begins variation 11. Variation 12 follows easily, but variation 13's markings require a massive change in tempo. The performer may approximately halve the tempo to quarter note equals 48, double that in variation 14 to quarter note equals 96. In which the Italian character marked sciolto requires an increase in tempo. This tempo relationship maintains the pulse while delivering the character change. Variations 15 to, through 17 will follow naturally. The Piumoso in variation 17 requires a shift in tempo and a fractional relationship works as a proportion. One may follow a ratio of 3 16th notes in variation 16 to the quarter note of variation 17 and thus begin variation 17 with a tempo of quarter note equals 144. That becomes, sorry, it's not working. The relationship works quite well. In order to follow the marking grazioso in variation 18, one may reduce the tempo back to quarter note equals 96. thus creating the opposite ratio. Sorry for the memory slip there. Of note, Brahms originally intended for ritardando to join the two movements without fermata, thus indicating a seamless transition. My proportionality reflects this intent while still honoring the present score. Variation 19 marked the Giro e Vivace in 12.8 follows and may take the tempo dotted quarter equals 72, thus creating another 4 to 3 ratio. The resulting proportion between variation 17 and 19 is 1 half, and any aural confusion across the three variations is prevented by the fermatas between variation 17 and 18 and 18 to 19. The logic of ratios may seem confusing at first, but a natural flow will emerge to the listener, and I'll demonstrate that now. This is variation 17. Seventy-two. 
The performer may also relate the following three variations similarly. Utilizing the same sense of proportion, the 16th note in variation 22 becomes the 8th note in variation 23, marked vivace e staccato. This tempo, dotted quarter equals 96, remains constant through variation 24 and into variation 25 in common time. The keeping of a strict bass tempo creates what Govias calls a compression effect, a mostly constant pulse applied with a broad brushstroke. The triumphant arrival of the final variation, originally marked fortissimo, is made even more energetic because the four sixteenth notes now occupy the space previously held by triplet eighth notes, and I will demonstrate that. This becomes dotted quarter equals 96. And the tempo holds steady. Into variation 25. The first 10 variations do not allow this process as easily, but the variety of character and the number of key changes and tempo changes are considerably greater in fewer variations. However, some proportionality is possible in variations 5 through 9, according to what I've listed below, and that way these variations will relate to the rest of the work. The tempo of the theme and first five variations are more difficult to proportion, but one may still choose tempi that return later in the work, thus unifying the piece's tempo structure as a whole. My linear plan for these first six movements has done so. Proportionality in a linear tempo plan is not an exact science, but the Handel variations' expression markings round off rigid sounding tempo relationships. With all of this practical knowledge, the performer is faced with the challenge of choosing Opus 24's underlying fundamental tempo, or tempi. Solving this problem with record of Brahms' own playing is the final main point of this presentation. Bernard Sherman asserts that Brahms did not believe that there is one ideal tempo for a work, quoting him in that any normal person would take a different tempo every week, and that is Brahms' own remark. And more than once he told musicians who disagreed about tempo in his music that both were right. This issue becomes even more critical when one reads Fanny Davies's admonition in the 1920s, which I'll now pull up. And for time's sake, I'm going to be breezing through most of the rest of the material so we have some time at the end. Fanny Davies remarked that the most important essential in starting to reproduce a work of Brahms is the tempo. All Brahms passages are strings of gems, and that tempo which can best reveal these gems and help to characterize the detail at the same time as the outlines of a great work must be considered to be the right tempo. No performance instruction of the Handel variations from Brahms himself exists besides the score. The earliest recording of the work is by Egon Petri in the late 1930s, and he had very little association with Brahms' circle. The earliest recording done by a Brahms pupil specifically was Etelka Freund in the 1950s, just before Leon Fleischer's recording and a decade before Julius Katchen's collection of the entire Brahms output. Fortunately, pianist and conductor Hans von Bülow maintained a collegial relationship with Brahms, which included a detailed performance history of Opus 24, and Bülow gave spe several specific instructions in his master classes at the Raff Conservatory in Frankfurt. 
he admonished pianist Jose Viana da Mota to play the theme, quote, very simply and without too much nuance. He also stated to students in two separate years that variation 22 is strident like a Scottish bagpipe. Other pianists left remarks about Brahms's manner of choosing tempi. Pianist Carl Friedberg, who coached Brahms's works with him, remarked in the 1940s that one can never play slowly enough for Brahms. Carl Friedberg also taught the teacher of one of my teachers, so the anecdotes are numerous, but in this case, this one is specifically recorded in, in print. Pianist Max Born, a decade earlier, than Friedberg, likewise commented that Brahms bemoaned to him the excessively quick tempi of his music, yet also agreeing with Fanny Davies that slower pieces were becoming too slow. These and other statements reveal a growing trend in performance of Brahms's music after his death, that Brahms, according to Max Rudolph in 1980, would not have approved of the rushed tempi we now sometimes hear. His music making was relaxed. Bernard Sherman has concluded that the general timing of pieces now is slower, though this assessment is by no means absolute. Tempo flexibility has also decreased, namely acceleration and deceleration within a tempo, and the modern piano is noticeably different from Brahms's in tone, sonority, and sustaining power. Another challenge for the performer is determining specific rules in playing Brahms's music his way, so to speak, especially in a piece with few markings as the Handel variations. This task may leave a performer frustrated because accounts of his playing often contradict his own words and each other. However, a cursory study of these accounts reveals trends that may be considered not rules, but more of guidelines. To quote Sherman, it may be that Brahms was concerned more with performers' ability to, con to convey musical content than with adherence to specific performance practices. At the same time, Brahms can be most insistent about matters of interpretation in the moment, such as the importance of stressing the first note in a two-note slur. And this is in accordance to Florence May's observation. And Florence May was another British pianist who documented her lessons with Brahms. Concerning rhythm, Fanny Davies wrote that Brahms's manner of interpretation was free, very elastic and expansive, but the balance was always there. One felt the fundamental rhythms underlying the surface rhythms. This and other evidence point to a spontaneity in tempo flexibility an approach that a performer may find applicable in the simple markings of the Handel variations, provided an underlying rhythm remains intact. Passages marked espressivo, such as in variations 5, 13, and 21, may contain more flexibility in tempo, as Clive Brown would assert in his masterful study of 19th century performance practice. One may attempt a replication of contemporary techniques such as hands playing asynchronously or offsetting a melody from its accompaniment, but a general guideline may be divined from the composer Bernard Schultz, a contemporary of Brahms. While rehearsing in 1859 with the baritone Julia Stockhausen, a friend and collaborator of Brahms, Schultz was told to play strictly in time against the baritone's flexible interpretation of the part. Schultz later wrote, through him, that is, through Stockhausen, the character of tempo rubato first became clear to me. Freedom of phrasing on a steady rhythmic foundation. This incident occurred two years before the Handel Variations was first performed. And Schultz's summary of contemporary understanding of rubato agrees with Fanny Davies's assessment of Brahms's freedom within etched rhythmic structures. Another indication of flexibility is the presence in the score of crescendo and diminuendo markings, in the form also in the form of hairpins, as we like to call them. Fanny Davies wrote that the sign, the hairpins, used by Brahms 
often occurs when he wishes to express great sincerity and warmth, applied not only to tone, but to rhythm also. He would linger not on one note alone, but on a whole idea, as if unable to tear himself away from its beauty. He would prefer to lengthen a bar or phrase rather than spoil it by making up the time into a metronomic bar. This marking for flexibility contrasted with rubato, however, it involved a planned action, not merely spontaneity. In conjunction with the writings of composers across the 19th century, such as Fanny Hensel, sorry, Fanny Hensel, or Liszt, or Hugo Riemann, that crescendo hairpin indicated a crescendo in movement and the opposite, a diminuendo in movement. Variations 20, 22, 23, and 24 provide ample opportunity for experimenting with this practice over a steady rhythmic foundation. Speeding up with getting louder was also a common trait among musicians of Brahms's day. Violinist Joseph Joachim, Brahms's longtime friend and collaborator, taught that Brahms would turn the first forte in the third violin sonata into an animato. Brahms also approved an accelerando at a written crescendo in the slow movement of the second cello sonata when rehearsing with cellist Robert Hausmann. Such practices are also communicated in the surviving recordings of Brahms's circle. The Handel variations provide, provides few opportunities for such dramatic shifts in tempo as similar markings of growing volume are confined to a measure at most, usually only a few beats. But variations 23 and 24 and the fugue offer several very clear instances to apply this practice, again with the caveat of maintaining the underlying pulse. Other contemporary practices include arpeggiating chords spontaneously. Though this was a common practice, Brahms's arpeggio markings in Opus 24 are very specific, particularly in variations 3 and 13 and the fugue. Florence May observed that Brahms avoided excessive arpeggiation, even if he himself wrote chords periodically in a seemingly unplanned manner. In conclusion, the Handel Variations offers the performer an opportunity to make informed decisions of tempo flexibility, proportion, and even interpretation of markings, all through careful readings of Brahms's own words, the words of those who knew him, and the score itself. The performer's presentation of markings of crescendo and diminuendo, their relevant hairpins, dynamic shifts, and arpeggios will therefore invite the audience to engage with tempo flexibility, one of Brahms's most praised or contested traits. Simultaneously, the performer can hold together a large-scale form through carefully crafted and flexible tempo proportionality between variations. Now, even with this responsibility of knowledge, the performer still remains autonomous in choice of tempo. Fanny Davies remarked, there is no doubt that the same artist will take a different tempo at a different time of life. The balance of dignity with detail comes with experience, but in gaining the one, the artist must not lose the other. However one chooses to interpret Brahms' score, in the end, all performers may heed Brahms' own advice. Do it how you like, but make it beautiful. At this point, I would play through the entire work to demonstrate all these concepts in action, but since time is limited, I would like to welcome any and all questions you may have. And just as a reminder, uh, we're using the Q&A function. If you have a question, uh, you can submit one uh, if you're joining us via Zoom with the Q&A function. If you're watching on Facebook Live, you can use the comments and we're monitoring those as well. Um, and Michael, while we give uh, people a time to, to consider questions that they might ask, um, 
perhaps you could tell us a little bit about how your, your first introductions to this particular work and um, sort of your general, like your, your, your arc with your relationship with this particular piece. My, my own linear temple plan, but not. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's twofold, actually. Um, when I was 13, I heard the piece for the first time and fell in love with it, got my hands on the score, attempted to learn it, which um, was a little young. Um, so while getting the piece in my blood, I was intrigued by a comment that a pupil of Carl Friedberg, who taught my childhood teacher, uh, once remarked to me that Friedberg taught that one should play the first four measures, is what he said, but um, the entire first phrase of a Brahms piece exactly in time, and then the rest of it as free as you would like. And I thought that's kind of a strange remark, but I found that through some of his pieces it worked extraordinarily well. And um, having studied this piece in particular, I found out, thanks to the suggestion of my, my former piano teacher, Awadajan Pratt, that certain markings were written differently in the finished score. I took that to the autograph copy and noticed that these markings were written all over the place, but then standardized, yet still different, so that immediately presented to a good mystery to solve. Mm. Um, I'm asked this question if I can elaborate on ways that knowledge of Brahms' piano as compared to ours might affect our consideration of tempo. The decay on Brahms' several choices of piano was much faster. If you look at variation 9, we have measure, measured pedal markings, um, two measures long. If we try that on a modern Steinway or any other piano, the decay is going to be considerably longer, the pedal is going to blur. It's likely that now we might choose a faster tempo. It's possible that the decay on a period instrument would, wouldn't be as much of a problem, the sound would die. Um, there are several resources out there. Um, one is Camilla Kai, I, I think that's how you say her name, C-A-I who's written extensively on this subject. Um, but I think it certainly can make a difference. I haven't done as much study in this as I would like, but I will now. Now, do we have any idea of applying those, is that tempo concepts? Mm -hmm. To orchestra so. repertoire? Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm. Applying these tempo concepts to orchestra repertoire, um, Bernard Sherman has written about this somewhat more. Um, Michael Musgrave, I'm just thinking back to the research I've done on this. Um, Brahms was a fairly flexible um, conductor and encouraged that in, from what we know of his own um, recollection, other people's recollections of his conducting, Bulov, um, one, George Henschel and others. Um, the proportionality makes sense in the score based on, let's say, the retracted metronome markings from the German Requiem. That's probably the strongest source we have for proportionality in Brahms' orchestral music. He withdrew his markings, so it's difficult to say that they were, you know, absolute, they must be followed at all times, but they give a great indication. I think it's, it's worth digging into those as a good place to start. Yeah, and for those who are unfamiliar, could you explain uh, just uh, just briefly about the, this, the idea of this retraction of the, of the metronome markings in the, in the Requiem? How that like why that was? In the Requiem, um, I'm not entirely sure just because mm -hmm. I, I was limiting most of my study to piano music. And, sure. Um, sure. But it, it's interesting that before the final printed copy, everything was 
withdrawn. He was initially um, asked to put metronome markings in mm -hmm. with the knowledge that they could change and you know hence his communication to um, Hensel. Mm -hmm. That was an incident where he's like, well, because people told me to. <laughs> and you know, he, like I said at the beginning of this presentation, he himself wouldn't use a metronome as a um, you know standard practice. It was just there for convenience. It's, it's like um, the late 1800s or late late 18th century people were saying there, there's this god awful practice of people leaving it on when they play, <laughs> which nowadays we wouldn't think of. Um, just clicking it once or twice, putting it away and practicing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or maybe we should. Yeah. Other questions? I have a few, few moments here for any other questions. I hope you all liked that um, period percussion effect of a glass table <laughs> breaking. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a first for sure. So <laughs> welcome to the, <laughs> welcome to history. Right? <laughs> Yeah. Do you have an idea of where um, where this research, um, where you can are continuing to go with this research? As it uh, is it leading you into different projects, uh, those types of things. I am deeply interested in Brahms' performance practice, just because um, you know the three Bs are some of the most contested um, composers as far as interpretation goes, but when one thinks about it, we aren't terribly removed from mm -hmm. this music. Brahms' bicentennial is coming in 13 years. And I'm, I'm thinking back to, let's say, Brahms, Carl Friedberg, Bob Bennett, Carol Oaks, me, for instance. Um, it's not terribly far. So I'd like to apply this kind of research to, let's say, the later works. Um, some of which we have period recordings of, and recorded, not period recordings, but uh, recordings of his students. And the fascinating thing is that the further back in time we go with recordings, the more we start to hear Brahms's own practices coming across, whether by people who played for him or just people who were alive when he was alive, such as that, um, you know, that quote of Julia Stockhausen I meant. Or I, I, I mentioned. Mm -hmm. So I, um, this is fairly open-ended at this point. Um, I plan on using today's presentation's material for my doctoral lecture recital, and those can be springboards for all sorts of mm -hmm. research adventures. Sure. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just, uh, for those of you joining us on Zoom, I just shared once again a link to the, the uh, online folder that has all of the handouts for today. Um, this was also shared earlier in the comment section on Facebook. And when we post the archived version of this presentation to our YouTube channel, we'll make sure that that is also linked in the description there. Um, and that will be posted later this evening and we'll have links to that in our newsletter that comes out tomorrow uh, on Tuesday the 19th and we'll have uh, uh, the, the complete recording and other information there for anyone who wants to uh, listen to that. Um, well, seeing no more questions at this moment, I um, want to thank you once again, Michael, for joining us and uh, leading us through this. Uh, it's, it's, you know, it's so, it's interesting to, to see um, how these kinds of how these kinds of studies can can really help uh, develop a, a, a complete view of a, of a larger work in these kind of connections. And so uh, I want to thank you uh, and thank everyone for joining us. Oh, we did have one other question here. Uh, what might you say to capricious performers such as Tepakman? I'm not sure. Oh, um, is that Vladimir Tepakman? Perhaps. <laughs> Listening to recordings that the, um, made from around the turn of the century, um, <laughs> you know, the first thing that comes to mind is that maybe some performers didn't take themselves as seriously as we do, we take ourselves now. <laughs> um, I think I've, if there's this one recording, I think it's of him playing um, the Chopin Black Key Etude, but I could be completely wrong. I've, 
I remember hearing some recordings just sounding like improvisations within the middle of a piece with glissandi all over the place and everything. These, these recordings are enlightening because they are such a huge step into the past. And, you know, even 50 years later, past this recording, I'm thinking of his Beno Moisevich playing this exact piece, the Handel Variations. If there is tempo proportionality, I wasn't able to find it while listening. It, it was very whimsical, but it was at the same time so beautiful. So, you know, my interpretation of the pieces is, is one of many, and I think we, we do well from following Brahms' own advice, just make it beautiful. Well, um, for everyone joining us and for anyone watching on the, uh, on the recorded feed afterwards, uh, our next intersession will be on June the 1st. So we're skipping next week for the Memorial Day holiday. Our next session will be on June the 1st um, with a presentation on the uh, James River Music Book. Uh, so you can find information about that on our website and I'm putting into the Zoom chat the uh, registration link. You can find out more about that particular project if anyone is interested uh, in that for two weeks from today on June the 1st. Uh, once again, on, on behalf of Early Music America, thank you very much, Michael Delphine, for joining us today. Uh, it was very enlightening. Oh, thank you for having me. It was a real treat. And thank you everyone for joining us. Bye.